So we're going to dive into vocabulary and I'm going to use the same format I used last time. And of course, you know, I hope you all know if that format is not working, please let me know. I'm very open to feedback. But I'm going to kind of do a, a fast, you know, run through some of the key research around vocabulary and key practices. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of dig in time to explore what is interesting to you um, and time to connect and collaborate. How do we teach vocabulary? And so we're going to just start with my favorite, one of my favorite quotes about vocabulary, and that vocabulary knowledge is the single greatest contributor to reading comprehension, and thus is a strong predictor of overall academic achievement. That's why it's so important to me, because if we don't understand the meaning of the words, we can decode all day long. But if we don't have an understanding of what the words mean, we will not understand the text. So our goal for vocabulary instruction is really to increase comprehension, but it's also to get words from just exposure to permanent memory so that we always know what it means and we hold that word. So we can tell students, you know, what a word means all day long, but that does not get it to permanent memory. So we want to think about how we move it to permanent memory so that they will use it when needed and that they have deep meaning of those words, not just a superficial level. So one of my favorite strategies that we can do with vocabulary is actually just doing a, a reflection on your vocabulary word, the knowledge of the vocabulary words. So this is what it looks like. And obviously I just use vocabulary words, but this is something we can do with our students where you introduce the words that you're gonna be focusing on in that day or that week or unit, however. And then you have them, before you teach anything, let them think, I've never even heard of this word. I have no idea what apposition means. Or I've seen the word, but I don't really know what it is. I can define it, or I can explain it or teach it to others. And so you can give them a simple chart like this and let them reflect on it at the beginning of the, of the learning. And then you can reflect on it at the end of the learning. And this can also be a great place for them to record their notes of what that word means so that they can explain it to others. So that's just one of my favorite strategies. So I thought I would start with that. So just take a quick peek at those and I'm not gonna have you do a chart, but uh, reflect on any of those words that you're unfamiliar with or that are not at, at level four for yourself. There is, um, hopefully by the end, Great, so I will make sure I explain what that word means today, I promise. But it helps the, the learner pay attention to what they don't know. And they're like, oh, that was one of the ones I don't know. So doing that preview is sometimes a really great activity to do with people. So vocabulary just begins with a language rich classroom. It really is the whole context and language is built all day long. So there's not really, we don't do vocabulary for 10 minutes. We do vocabulary all day long in every single thing that we do. And, but some of the three ways that we can create a really rich vocabulary um, uh, language environment is through read alouds with really um, rigorous text because exposure to text above their grade level or their reading level is actually how one way that we build vocabulary with students. Okay. A second way is teacher usage of very sophisticated language um, and us modeling that. And then a lot of opportunities for language production and collaborative conversation. So those are just three things that we wanna be doing all the time to create a language rich environment. Because oral language is really the foundation of all of this. And it really is how we primarily learn vocabulary. And we do learn it somewhat through reading and through print, but we probably get a lot more of it through the oral language tradition. So when we think about read aloud, they should be really high quality with rich vocabulary, wide range of topics. And then we take a moment to teach those words in context or brief explanations, but also that the students interact with it, have conversations and talk about it. And then we pick a few key words to focus on, not too many, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Our use of sophisticated language, I pulled out, I found a really great resource, but us just trying to accumulate a large collection of vocabulary that we were to use with our students throughout the school day. Um, the kids love it when we use the big words, you know what I mean? And so anytime we can use a synonym to a traditional word that we use to really ramp um, the vocabulary up 
is going to really help build that vocabulary in a very indirect way. So I used to always use the word, let's not dawdle. That was one of my favorite words because they'd be really slow. I say, stop dawdling, you know? So all my, all my second and third graders knew what the word dawdle meant just because I used it on a regular basis. So here's some samples and there's a hyperlink to um, some additional lists for you. But I just thought I would share that with you. So the more we can, you know, try to utilize more advanced language and encourage our students to do that as well, the more that we will just naturally build vocabulary with them. Even being very intentional. So I know a lot of um, people do like a daily message in the morning, especially in kindergarten. So again, instead of just today is going to be a great day, we're constantly uh, changing those words out and using a more advanced vocabulary word and then getting the students to repeat it so that they are using those vocabulary words. And we can do this with our older students as well, not in a daily message, um, anytime they're writing. So we can give them word banks with more advanced language and, and encourage them to use them. And then one of my uh, favorite activities is doing a word jar activity. I used to do this in my classroom. Link to the Jamboard. So if anybody wants to add a word to our Jamboard, I would love it. There's a the Jamboard. We know when we're reading texts or watching videos or learning about things, we always hear like really interesting words that are new to us, right? And so I used to have a space in my classroom where we collected our words. And there's actually a book called The Word Jar, Donovan's Word Jar, if you're not familiar with it. So I did read that book to my students. And then, but we collected words all throughout the year. Every time anybody could use one of the words in a sentence or in the writing or in speaking, their table group got an extra point. And so it was super fun because they love to use the words from the word jar. So that's a fun way to do that. So you can have a digital word jar in a, in a um, Jamboard, or you can have that posted um, in your classroom. But I love to do that. And then you can also do word a day. So I gave you a link here. I don't know if you guys know about this. You go to this website every day and they give you a new word. So here's the word for today, it's shifty. Um, so you can uh, put your word of the day up on the, on the whiteboard and you can talk about it and challenge yourself to use it that day. If you sign up for an account, they'll actually email it to you as well. So just doing fun vocabulary words um, each day is also fun. And then obviously, and I'm not, I could do five hours on just, you know, collaborative conversations, but actually explicitly teaching our students those rich um, discussion protocols but again, ramping up the language with our students is going to build oral vocabulary as well with them. So as we, so those were just kind of strategies just to create a language rich environment with lots of vocabulary and playing with language. Then there's also very explicit teaching. And so when we think about explicitly teaching vocabulary, there's really three main approaches. One approach is to teach students, what do you do when you're reading and you find an unknown word? So what are your strategies for learning a new word? And that's hugely important. And that's actually what reading for the vocabulary standard asks them to do is this one. And then there's also specific word instruction where we directly teach the meaning of a word. And we'll I'll talk about how to prioritize which words. And then there's just word consciousness where they're developing vocabulary more globally in terms of themes and units and concepts and related words. And then obviously all those things that I talked about earlier in terms of a language rich classroom. So let's look at word learning strategies. And so that is where we teach students, what do you do if you run into a word that you are unfamiliar with? And there are 12 basic word learning strategies. So, and I'll talk about these all briefly, but the first one is word study or morphology, where we look at the parts of a word or look inside a word. Apposition or an appositive. So my friend that wanted to know what that word meant. Apposition, comma, when the definition is right next to the word comma, is a word learning strategy. Teaching students that a lot of times an author will put the definition of that word right next to it, but it's always surrounded by commas. And then context clues, and people always say, well, let's use context clues, but we need to be very explicit because there are five types of context clues that are very different, and I'll show you that in a bit. And then we obviously have dictionaries or computers. 
We can actually use illustrations sometimes to help us figure out the meaning of a word. We have cognates, we have phone a friend, ask somebody. I do that one all the time. I always call my mother when I'm reading medical text. Uh, so what does this word mean? And schema, any prior knowledge. And so those are the main 12 strategies. So obviously explicit teaching of affixes and what the prefixes and suffixes and roots mean. So I gave you a list of the, probably the most common prefixes. I actually gave you some decodable books down here too, if you're interested, but that explicit teaching of those, also posting them, finding examples, creating anchor charts, having kids make notebooks, those types of things, have them coming up with new words, doing a lot of work with prefixes and what those mean. And we can really begin this in the primary grade too. It's not just an upper grade skill, but begin introducing those in kindergarten and first grade is um, important as well. And then obviously, you know, pointing out the root of words. And then, but here's where the power is. You can teach them what the root is, but it's really about when we make teach them all the other related words around them. That is when they're going to hold that root. So again, remember I said earlier, learning is when you connect something to something else, you're always connecting to what they know. So the more that you can do vocabulary instruction around a concept um, like this, where they learn a lot of different words, will really help them to hold the word, not just learn what struck means. So here's another one. So you can see, you know, they're focusing in on several words around the same root. I personally, with the, in the older grades, love vocabulary notebooks where they have a root word and they have to, all sorts of different examples of words. They have a website where you've given the root word and it'll populate a tree for you. So super cool. So again, doing morphology walls, just making words and parts of words just really visible around the classroom. Here's our first grade example. We begin suffixes in first grade, even kindergarten. So kind of talking about what those mean with our students will help build vocabulary with our students. So then it's all about modeling also. So I'm gonna show you one of my very favorite clips of a teacher modeling how to use strategies to figure out an unknown word. Certain parts in the text, that many students got stuck at. And so I'm going to show you how I go through and solve for some of those words that are confusing. It says, in 1945, an engineer by the name of Richard James was hard at work in a Philadelphia shipyard. The US Navy had hired him to invent a stabilizing device for its ships. Now, when I first saw that word stabilizing, I wasn't quite sure what it meant. So I'm first gonna look inside the word, okay? And I'm gonna try to notice anything that's familiar to me. I'm gonna look for a prefix first. No, I don't see a prefix. Let me look for a suffix. I do see ing. And I know that a lot of times ing is a verb, but I think it's describing a kind of device. So in this sentence, I think stabilizing is some kind of adjective here. And I don't recognize anything inside the word. Hmm, hold on, let me look at the beginning. I see S-T-A, sta, or stay. Okay. I know that that's a Greek and Latin root that means to stand or to stay. So I'm thinking that this has something to do with something that stands. But that doesn't make much sense to me on a boat that moves. So I'm now going to go back into the text and I'm going to read a couple sentences to see if I can pick up on some clues. Let me go back. The U.S. Navy had hired him to invent a stabilizing device for its ships. I'm going to keep reading. When a ship is plowing through the waves at sea, it pitches and plunges and rocks every which way. And its navigational instruments do too. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at this picture and now I'm starting to understand. The boat rocks every which way when it's on the ocean, partly because of the waves. I know that, I've been on a boat before. Okay, they needed to invent something that would help keep things in one place or to stand, stay. 
So I'm thinking that a stabilizing device must be some kind of tool that the Navy needs to use in order to keep things in one place. Now it's making sense to me. So I'm going to continue reading. So I just love that clip. So really just doing a lot of think alouds with students instead of just automatically going for giving them the definition. One of the best things we can do is model how they could figure it out. And then once they learn those strategies, ask them to try it. Like, what For do we know? What might it be, right? Um, so you can do lots of activities and having them dig into words and, you know, find, you know, create new words. So give them prefixes and suffixes and roots and have them develop a whole list of new words with me and what their meaning would be. So there's lots of fun ways to interact with vocabulary or giving them words and have them find the prefixes and suffixes and roots. And these can all be partner activities, group activities, and you can lift them right out of the text that you're already reading it. I'm not gonna play this, but I thought this was a really cute video I happened to found, find, and it's called, Can You Prove It? And so they were working on the suffix shun. The students did it like in a game show format and they had to prove that which, what the meaning was. And they had to give all their evidence. So again, it's about creating a culture focused on um, language. So here's our definition of apposition. So that's the other, so that's really what it looks like. There's always commas around it, then different context clues. So I, I do love the IDEAS acronym to help students. I think that's really helpful. But what's most important, I for me, is that when we're teaching context clues that we teach them to look for signal words. So how they know. So I've given you kind of my cheat sheet chart that I use. You know, I can look for signal words that will help me. So if I see for example, that means they're probably going to give me an example of what that means. Or as opposed to, so it's really about teaching them the signal words in the text that helps them trigger what type of context clues they might use. And then over here on the side, these are like the questions that I might ask my students. So in, in instruction, I can prompt some of those things. And then here's, you can also do word detectives, right? So give them a couple of words from the text that they're going to be reading that day or that week. They have to look for text clues and they, then they have to talk about which strategy did they use and what do they think it means. So this is a great partner or group activity to get them to practice and apply those different vocabulary strategies. A lot of work around teaching them how do you figure out an unknown word is absolutely crucial. And then there's the direct teaching of words. So when we think about specific word instruction, what the research basically says that you want to focus on tier two and tier three words, which I'll talk about in a moment, but you don't want to do a lot of them. One to five at the most. I think five is too many personally. I don't ever usually go more than three, maybe five across a week, but in one session, I usually only do one or two words. I don't usually rely on my instructional materials to tell me which words to teach. I think about what are the most critical words for my students to know to understand that text or to understand that concept. They can be either done as a pre-teach, it can be in the middle, or it can be done later. It, it, it depends on what your goal is for it. But using a vocabulary word routine to do that is really, really helpful. And I use Anita Archer's. But we want to probably focus on tier two words, you know, the academic words, and those are words that also usually transfer across content, or they can be tier three words, which is kind of more content specific. So here's my favorite tier two words. Um, I think if they don't know these, um, it's pretty hard to do anything in language arts, actually in most content areas. So these become really super important. Um, and then for tier three words, those are kind of just um, content specific. So since we, I think, are mostly language arts here, but we all teach other things as well, but some of the ones that are absolutely essential in language arts. So if we look at tier two and tier three words, you'll see that they mostly, they all fall in text. So these are just some examples of what might be a tier two and what might be a tier three for you. And so we want to make sure we have the right balance. We teach too many tier one and tier three, and we, so we really want to be thoughtful about are we teaching enough tier two words. Here's the criteria. Is it a word that they're going to meet often in the world? It's, it's frequent. It's going to be necessary. It has a lot of connections and it's going to give us concepts, right? And so when we teach it, I personally love Anita Archer's routines of uh, verbalize, define, and use. Basically, you say the word, you give information about the word, you give a definition and examples, 
and then you can talk about variations and then you use it in a sentence and then they have to use it also. So then they interact with it. So I can tell them words all day long, but until they interact with it and use it and apply it, they're probably not gonna hold that word. For example, the word is pester. What word? Pester. Tap and say the parts of the word, pester, pester. Again, pester. Pester is a verb or an action word. When you say or ask for something again and again and again and again and again and again and again, you pester another person. So my dog pestered me to play. He kept bringing me the ball and over and over and over and he would never stop. So the dog was pestering me. Or do you want to pester the teacher? No, you please do not pester the teacher. Do not ask me over and over and over and over again for something. But some other words for pester are annoy or bother. So in introducing the word, but giving them lots of examples of what the word means and have them talk about it and what's an example of pester. And then my favorite vocabulary strategy is a Freyer model where they have to construct this organizer where they talk about examples and non-examples, characteristics, they can put an image in, and then you do the definition last, but just what does it pester mean? But the critical part of a, a Freyer model is that they're interacting with it. So it's not copy my Freyer model, but they're constructing their own Freyer model with a partner or group, and then they're having discussions about the word and being asked to utilize the word in, um, in context. So I've given you two videos here. If you'd like to watch Anita Archer model her routine, she's absolutely amazing at teaching vocabulary. So I highly recommend those for you. And then lots of exposure and word consciousness is the third element. Just building words around a concept or a theme or whatever unit you're studying and developing vocabulary or connecting words to familiar words. So we know the word good, let's find all the words related to good and, and study those. And again, making those connections is where we remember them because words in isolations don't use, aren't usually very sticky, but if we do all sorts of sound words, they're more likely to remember them and more likely to use them. Actually, I'll show the paint strips, chips in a minute. So there's the Freyer model, visuals, graphic organizers, but again, notice they're all conceptual. So concepts or ideas grouped together. Paint chips, I love the paint chips, run to Home Depot or Lowe's. <laughs> and then we can kind of find related words and you can put them on rings. So if you have students constantly using the same word like over and over again. <laughs> what are some other words for like, right? And so they can go grab the paint chips or it can be on an anchor chart. And then you can also do like gradation of words, you know, of more intense to less intense or whatever. So um, shades of meaning basically. So again, here's examples of teaching words together. And here are some more. Anytime you want a rich language. So then when we're writing or speaking, well, I do usually when we write, but they have to revise our sentences. So you just wrote something, you have to find three words that you change and put a more interesting word in. So, or one or two, whatever you can, whatever, depending on the grade of your students. So again, conceptual, and they can do treasure hunts and text. So find words that mean the same as good or like, or find words that are character traits, find words that have the root word of, you know, spec. So whatever it is that you're working on, have them go into text and look for and hunt for words and collect them and put them in their notebooks. We can create lots of organizers around different concepts. Mm -hmm.